5.30 on the dot. Thank you, Pablo, with authority for uh, helping us time. Uh, I will call us to order at 5.30. Uh, welcome to uh, the latest uh, gathering of the Zoning Advisory Committee. Uh, we will start with agenda item 1.02, roll call. Uh, and I will do that in my capacity as the vice chair. Uh, Michelangelo Aranda. Present. Polly Boardman. Present. Shannon Coley. Melissa Cook Sanford. Present. Kristen DeHaan. Present. Cami Eloquis Luray. Present. Did I say it right? Yes, he did. Thank you. Okay. Darren Fleck. RSVP no absent Ryan Henderson present Eddie Hirschman present Mia Mansfield present Adriana Publico present Tyler Rogers present Lauren Rushing maybe delayed yeah well, Mark is absent for now okay well we have a quorum do you mind passing that down to Shannon please a uh, reminder for folks on public comment to submit uh, a blue card to Shannon at the end of, of the, the, the you here uh, for items. We will take public comment for anything on the agenda that is marked for action. Uh, that will bring us into uh, the second part of our agenda, item 2.01, introduction of new members to the Zoning Advisory Committee for information only. Uh, we've got four new members to uh, the Zoning Advisory Committee. I'm going to introduce each of them by name and let them quickly introduce themselves, just background and what they're interested in and excited about for zoning. Uh, and there's Lauren. Cool. So we can mark her uh, as present. Hey, Lauren. Uh, okay. So first on the list is Michelangelo uh, Aranda. Michelangelo, you want to introduce yourself, please? Yes, so nice to meet you all. My name is Michelangelo Aranda. Uh, in my current capacity, I am the talent manager for Washoe County School District. Uh, my team oversees the hiring and retainment of all wonderful personnel that uh, goes into our schools and to our central building here. Uh, I'm a product of the school district. Uh, Mr. Hirschman was actually my teacher at one point. And uh, I have a... <laughs> He's older than he looks. <laughs> Uh, and I have a strong proclivity uh, for the school district if it's not apparent. Uh, so uh, I have two kids that are currently in the school district. Uh, I have been an affect of some zoning irregularities uh, in my lifetime. And so to be able to be on this board and have uh, a voice of my family, my friends, and my colleagues is going to be something super exciting and fills me up with pride. So thank you for allowing me to be here. Thank you, Michelangelo. Pleasure to have you. Uh, next, Cami. I'm Cami Elquist Loray. Um, I am a communication strategist uh, that I'm a consultant. Um, and I have a child that is a senior at McQueen High School. And I was just looking for a way to get involved with the community and uh, specifically with uh, education. And so I'm happy to be here and to contribute in any way I can. Thank you, Cami. Pleasure to have you. Next is Ryan. Uh, Ryan Henderson. Sorry, that's a little loud. Uh, I have two kids in the school district. Um, my oldest is a sophomore at Spanish Springs. My youngest is seventh grade at uh, Sky Ranch. Um, just looking to get more involved. Uh, was kind of asked by Mia here, and it sounded like I think I could contribute. Um, been married for 20 years. Uh, also a product of the school district. Been uh, born and raised here. Um, yeah, that's about it. Thank Thanks, you. Ryan. Thanks for, thanks for being here. And lastly, uh, Eddie, or I guess Mr. Hirschman. As we know. <laughs> Mr. Hirschman. Um, I uh, spent all my career here teaching, um, and then all my admin career here. So, But all of my experience has been on site. Currently, I'm at Spanish Springs High School as an assistant principal, and I just wanted to <clears throat> get a more global perspective to see some, how things that happen, decisions that are made, affect the site. I always get the site view, so I wanted to get a larger view and a more global view to kind of make more contributions that way, or hopefully make more contributions that way. <laughs> awesome. Thank you for being here. Yeah. Uh, and thank you to all of the other committee members uh, that have come back. This only works if there's community and staff engagement. So uh, it's exciting to see a full body uh, for Zach this year. 
That brings us to item 2.02, .02, discussion and possible action to select a chair of the Zoning Advisory Committee for a term ending June 30th, 2026 from the current membership. Do I need to read all the names? No. Sure, yeah. okay. Uh, Polly Boardman, Shannon Coley, Melissa Cook Sanford, Kristen DeHaan, Darren Fleck, uh, Mia Mansfield, Adriana Publico, Tyler Rogers, Lauren Rushing, Cami Eloquist Larray, Eddie Hirschman, Ryan Henderson, and Michelangelo uh, Aranda. Uh, we are selecting a new chair because uh, our esteemed chairwoman, Christine Hull, is uh, graduating to the big leagues, as I say, uh, moving on to the school board. Uh, I'd like to thank her for all that she's done with the Zoning Advisory Committee uh, over the past number of years. Uh, I did exchange a check with her today, uh, and she wanted to let all of us know that our community is a better place for the work done by Zach, and I'm looking forward to seeing the future of our district through the lens of zoning as our facility modernization plan begins to take shape. So kudos to her and for her service. Uh, and so this is uh, an action to select a new chair uh, for the term this year. I'm happy to put my name forward uh, as a candidate for that. Uh, so I'll lay it out there, but is there anyone else uh, or any sort of discussion, anyone else that would like to have a discussion about the roles of the chair uh, or also, yes, that I think it's sort of open for discussion. I would nominate Tyler Rogers because he has done such a phenomenal job in the short time that I've been a part of this committee in running the meetings effectively. So you have my vote. I appreciate the support. Before, and and we're happy to take a motion. Before we do that, this is an item for action, so I do want to take public comment if there is any. But before we take that, are there, is there any sort of other co conversation amongst the, the committee? Why do you want to be chair, Tyler? Why do I want to be chair? Yeah. Um, I believe in this institution of the school district, and as a community member with uh, one kid in the school district as well as another that will come. I've got a six-year-old daughter, Jesse Beck, and a, a someday a future aspiring uh, Washington County School District student as well as my wife is a teacher in the district so I believe in this institution and, and I feel like this is a small way it's participating in this this committee to give back to an institution that I benefited from being and growing up here um, and I think it's really important for the community to have a voice in these sorts of processes and I feel like that's fundamental to Zach in the beginning of this conversation, you mentioned the um, role of the chair. So can you go over just a couple of those responsibilities? Sure. Uh, I think it starts primarily with engaging with staff before these gatherings to review the agenda and agree on the type of topics uh, that we want to be on. And so there's an interface that the chair will have with staff uh, to agree on what is going into the agenda. Staff will bring ideas, but if we have uh, opinions as a committee, I can be a conduit for that. Uh, there's the responsibility to also run these meetings. Uh, I, I think the chair is best in a role to sort of let the community, the committee try to act and provide motions, but to facilitate the meeting and move, move things along effectively. Um, uh, in my tenure of existing on Zach, we've never had like tenuous situations. We've, I think we've, we've prided ourselves in being pretty unanimous in our like actions. And so I think that's a, that's a, a, a tradition that we should try to continue to work on. Um, and then the last like functional bit that I'm aware of is sort of the chairperson is to then go to the board of trustees and to present our recommendations for them to finally take the action. So sitting down with uh, in the board meetings and representing our voice is sort of the primary role. Any other questions before we check for public comment? Okay, Shannon, do we have any public comment on this action item? Yes, there's public comment for 2.02 .02 .02 by Pablo. Great, Pablo, welcome, welcome back. Hello guys. Hello, my name is Pablo Nadua. I will nominate Ty Wedger as the chair for the chairman for the Zoning Advice Committee. Have a nice day. Thank you, Pablo. Do we have any other public comment? No. Okay, then I think we're looking for action. Does anyone wanna make a motion on this? I move that the Zoning Advisory Committee selects Tyler Rogers as the chair for a term ending June 30th, 2026. I second. Kristen okay. DeHaan, for the record. Fabulous. We have a motion and a second. Um, any discussion on this motion before we vote? Okay. Uh, all those in favor of uh, the motion on the table, say aye. 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 All those opposed, say nay. The motion is passed. Thank you for your faith. Cool, let's find a vice chairman. 
Uh, let's move on to item 2.03, discussion and possible action to select a vice chair of the Zoning Advisory Committee for a term ending June 30th, 2026 from the current membership, including Polly Boardman, Shannon Coley, Melissa Cook Sanford, Kristen DeHaan, Darren Fleck, Mia Mansfield, Adriana Publico, Tyler Rogers, Lauren Rushing, Cami Eliquis Larray, Eddie Hirschman, Ryan Henderson, and Michelangelo Aranda. Uh, that's the person who recently held this position uh, as the vice chair. I think I'll quickly summarize the responsibilities. Um, roll call is, is top of the list. So obviously you'll sort of fill in at the start of a meeting to run roll call. Um, but more importantly, um, obviously the, the vice chair will step in if there's an instance in which I can't cover a meeting. I do have to travel sometimes for professional work. Uh, I expect all the dates currently will work, but there is an instance in which I can't attend, and so the vice chair will have the potential need to sit in and run a meeting. Um, totally an option for the vice chair to join uh, the sessions in front of the board. I, I actually never did that with Christine. It worked fine, but I think that's absolutely fine if both voices want to go and present in front of uh, the board. So I think that's this sort of my summary. Would anyone else add anything else uh, on this? sort of the roles and responses they've seen of vice chairs in the past? Yeah. As the vice chair, did you ever, with Christine, go with staff to generate the agendas for the meetings? Because when I was Beth's vice chair, we did to that together. But that was a long time ago. I would like to do that. I think it's sort of up to the relationship of the chair and the vice chair. Uh, Christine was open to that, and but I also trusted her a fair amount. So I, I, I personally would be completely open for that. Um, I think another thing that Christine and I would do is actually go out and sometimes in, invest time with the schools in which they were impacted uh, in person. So I intend to, to continue that as a, as a chair, but I would encourage the vice chair to be, that's sort of an opportunity too, is just a little bit more engagement with the community and you know the, the parent-teacher organizations at each of these schools. So a little bit more investment of time. But again, optional, it's not required. Uh, would it, Anyone like to raise their hand to be considered uh, as a vice chair? Okay, Michelangelo, Shannon, anyone else over here? Did I miss a hand? Okay, why don't we just go in order? I saw, saw hands. Michelangelo, do you want to sort of speak to your interest? Yeah, um, it's, it's again a, a passion of mine to serve our school district in more ways than one. Um, I think it's a good opportunity uh, as I aspire to hopefully be chair one day to be able to learn more through the course of it. Uh, I love the community involvement in it. Uh, I love being able to go to the school sites. Uh, I'm pretty available. Uh, I work down the hall, so I think that I can make it here most times. Um, and I do roll call very well. <laughs> great, great pitch, great campaign. Shannon, you raised your hand as well. Would you like to add some words? Yeah. Um, I don't know. I'm a terrible public speaker, so that, there you go. Um, but I have time. My kids are fully grown, and I'm invested. I've done a lot with the modernization, tons with the modernization projects, and I'd love to get more involved. Wonderful. Yep. Anyone else want to raise their hand here? We've got two great, great volunteers. Okay, do folks have any questions of the folks that have raised their hand to help them inform their vote? Lauren Rushing, for the record, how do you all handle conflict? Conflict to me is just a conversation, a conversation waiting to be had. So conflict requires a lot of listening, uh, extreme listening, and being able to understand, reword, and be able to um, resolve it in a way, whether that is one person's way or another, or at least coming to a common agreement. And more likely than not, I try to always go for a common agreement um, so that there's a better understanding to go forward. Yeah, I'm super practical, super pragmatic, um, trying to come to the center of every decision. There's extremes. Let's, let's try to meet in the middle. That's about it.
Jen, I think I'm, I'm curious since you've been through the zoning the sort of committee experience, like what you've observed and learned from that time that the sort of would help you sort of run things more efficiently because so, you kind of know the, know the ropes. And if you agree with that, if you feel like you, you observed it. I don't know that I could run it more efficiently than Christine and you, you guys were amazing. I, and that's why I'm here again. And that's, I thought this is such an important committee and I have such respect for these people. I mean, it is, I'm in awe and I, I love everything about it. I think it's very serious and, and very deep and, and people are trusting of us. I mean, it's a big deal. It's a very big deal for people. So I take it very seriously. I think the last question that I have too on this front is, uh, I think this sets, you, sets up a commitment to, to zoning advisory committee in a longer term. Michelangelo, you mentioned like maybe a potential desire to be a chair in, in the future, but I think the, the vice chair that we pick is sort of heading in that direction. And so I'm just curious, you've made that commitment or intent, and Shannon, if, I'm just curious where your mind is on that front. Um, it terrifies me, <laughs> but I, I am committed, absolutely. But again, terrible public speaker. <laughs> well, kudos for speaking in public. <laughs> Any other questions, or does anyone wanna make a, a, a motion on this front? How do we do with two? Yeah, like um, I think someone someone will need to make a motion for one of them. <laughs> public comment, I'm sorry, correct. Before we ask for a motion, is there any public comment, Shannon, on this item? Yes, we have public comment by Pablo. Oh, I. Mostly I will nominate uh, Melissa Stamf Cook Stamford, but I'm going to go for Marco, Michelangelo, Amanda, or as a first fight chair, man, and Sarah Coley as a second fight chair, man. So, hear my suggestion. So, thank you, Pablo. Do we have any other public comment? No. Wonderful. Would anyone like to make a motion on uh, both of the two folks that have raised their hand? I'd like to make a motion to nominate Shannon Coley as vice chair of the Zoning Advisory Committee. Is it for a two-year term though, like the president, like the chair, or is it one-year term? Because the it says 2026, but I don't know if that's accurate. That's a good catch. Uh, I thought it was an annual thing. Do we have? Uh, I think that's what we've done historically. Yeah, that's why I was stuck on that when I was saying, I'm like, 26 is Yeah. So can we amend that live? Sort of say, like, I don't know, how, how does that work if we want to? We can't amend it. <laughs> cool. That's what, it's a lesson to learn to read the agenda closely. Cool, okay. Um, same, same deal then. Does that change uh, either of your views on the commitment? No, okay, very good. So we have a motion on, on the table. Uh, anyone want to second it? Lauren Rushing, second. Wonderful, okay. So we have uh, an action to take. Is there any remaining discussion before we vote on this? Wonderful, okay. All those in favor of the motion to elect Shannon Cooley as the vice chair uh, of the Zoning Advisory Committee, say aye. 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 All those uh, opposed say nay. Great, the motion passes. Congratulations, Shannon. Two years, here we go. <laughs> I only have one word, it's Coley? Coley. Coley. I keep saying Coley, I'm it's sorry. Okay. It's okay, it's okay. Just as long I, as we get I that need, right. Yeah, exactly, thank you. Uh, okay, let's move on to Item 2.04, approval of the minutes uh, of the November 16th, 2023 meeting of the Zoning Advisory Committee for possible action. The meeting minutes were included in our pack um, for folks review as well as shared in advance of the meeting. Does anyone have any questions uh, on the meeting minutes? 
or amendments? Uh, chair, because I was not part of this board at that time, I'll not be voting, I'm assuming, or would I still vote? Uh, I don't know. They can still vote, I assume? Yes, you can still vote. Thank you. Because in theory, you could have watched the meeting and still have a, a view on it. But good question, thank you. Any questions on this? Okay, uh, because it is an item for action, is there any public comment on the meeting minutes? No. Okay. Uh, is there a motion to approve the meeting minutes? I motion to approve the meeting minutes from November 16th, 2023. Thank you. Is there a second? I second that. Wonderful. Uh, all those in favor uh, of approving the meeting minutes from uh, November 16th, 2023, say aye. 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 All those opposed? Great. The motion passes. The meeting minutes are approved. Moving on, section item 20.5. Presentation from the Washington County School District Office of General Counsel on Nevada Open Meeting Law, Nevada Rise Statutes 241, Requirements for Public Bodies. This is for presentation only. Learning about the Open Meeting Law is sort of a tradition of how we start the zoning advisory season. Uh, and so we've got our good uh, counsel here, Kevin, uh, to educate all of us, new and old, on Open Meeting Law. Kevin, welcome. Hi, thank you very much. I'm Kevin Pick. I'm the District's General Counsel for Labor and Employment Matters. Uh, I also oversee two of the committees, so I deal with open meeting law issues. I'm subbing for Chief General Counsel Rombardo for tonight, and so you have to unfortunately put up with me. Uh, he literally wrote the book on open meeting law in Nevada, and so he is the source. And so I can only hope to come close to what he would be able to tell you. But um, We'll go through the same process, and this is the same open meeting law presentation that all of our committees get and that the Board of Trustees gets. And so there may be some overlap and some things that don't necessarily apply to this committee that may apply more to the Board of Trustees. And, but it's important that all of our committees and all the board members all get the same presentation. It's uh, for consistency purposes. So um, I'll call out where something might be more applicable to the Board of Trustees than the Zoning Committee, uh, but uh, just try and realize that this is for all the committees and the Board as well. Oh, sorry. No, you're fine. Thanks. Uh, the first thing we want to talk about is uh, there's been some recent changes to how agendas look here at the Washoe County School District, and there's been some new language that's been added regarding disruption of public meetings, and um, we like to share this with the committee. I don't think this is one of those that I don't think this is going to necessarily be a factor that the Zoning Committee will deal with. This is really more for the Board of Trustees, but again, for consistency purposes, it's important for us to educate all committees and committee members on these uh, because there are some changes to the agendas that have been made. Uh, we can see here there's a new notice section that's been added for disrupting public meetings. Disrupting public meetings can be considered a criminal act in Nevada, and so we, are, we have amended and changed our agendas to include this notification on there for uh, people who may come, and so they know that there's uh, criminal rules that do apply in the event of uh, conduct that would potentially violate these. Now, the second thing I want to call your attention to is uh, the presiding officer, who is our new chair, Tyler Rogers, congratulations, uh, may or actually order the removal of people from the committee, uh, uh, from the public, uh, who are disrupt the orderly, efficient, and safe conduct of the meeting. Uh, so some things that see, you know, personal attacks, uh, profane use of, you know, profanity, that sort of thing, that can ask to be removed eventually. And we'll get into that more in another slide here. But the bottom left-hand portion just highlights what can happen to agendas as well, too. Agenda items can be taken out of order. They can be combined with other agenda items. They can be removed from the agendas. They can be moved to the consent agendas, which uh, the Zoning Committee doesn't really have a consent agenda, but this is, again, one of those crossover issues. And uh, the board can actually, or committees, can actually take a recess at the discretion of the presiding officer as well. Uh, 
So we've seen it a couple times here tonight with the public comments. Uh, the staff liaison and the recording secretary are now putting up new slides when public comment has been uh, is called for, and uh, it's really just to provide some necessary notices to the people who are giving public comment. And so we've seen that a couple times already tonight. Uh, the bottom section talks about uh, our recommendations for handling challenges in public comments. And again, this is really for instances of where the committee chair needs to act for to address profane conduct, profane language in public comments, personal attacks, disruptive of the general course of the proceedings as well too. Uh, the chair can step in uh, if one of those occurs. We re always recommend that uh, the chair provide a warning to the person who is using profane commentary or, you know, making personal attacks from the public comment from the podium up here. And uh, if it continues, uh, the chair has the discretion to essentially call a recess and uh, until order can be restored in the room. And so that's uh, generally how that's handled. Thank you. The next is on the adjournment to the meetings. And uh, this committee does act a lot and, uh, you know, uh, have after hours meetings uh, consistently. So the first portion of this really does apply here. And so the recording secretary will be posting a notice of what the public hours are for the public buildings and that members of the public should exit at adjournment. And so this is essentially a reminder that when the meeting is done, the building is closed essentially, it's closed to the public after the adjournment of the meeting. Uh, but the public needs to exit at that time, but then they should be given reasonable opportunity to do so. And now, uh, this is kind of our general primer on open meeting law. And so meetings are, you only need a quorum for meetings. And so what is a meeting? A meeting is where members deliberate towards a decision or take action on any matter which the public body has supervision, control, jurisdiction, and advisory power over. That's a meeting. And so you need quorums for meetings. Uh, let's talk about, like, if it was a social function, let's say you all went to a party together and it was not a zoning party. It's, uh, it was just a normal party. You all happened to be there, but you weren't discussing business. You weren't taking action. You all can be in the same place at the same time, but you just can't be deliberating or taking action on anything within the scope of the zoning committee. Uh, exceptions to this, there are some exceptions for uh, attorney meetings regarding litigation, but really none of those exceptions are, for the most part, going to apply to the zoning committee. Uh, the second thing is, what's a quorum? It's, uh, a quorum is 51% uh, of uh, members being present in order to hold a meeting. And so vacant committee positions, and this has been a recent change, do not count towards a quorum. And so uh, the vacancies, vacant positions really kind of think about it as reducing the quorum that's necessary. And so if you, math problem for everyone, if you have 10 spots in a committee, you have three vacancies, seven filled, what's a quorum? Four, yeah, four, so everyone, very good. You passed the, the, the lone math question on the, uh, on the open meeting law test But here. for our committee for this year, Kevin, since we do have 13 seats filled, we need seven people present to have a meeting? It's a majority. Okay. Yeah, exactly. So uh, the agendas, that's a good one. This is our primer on the agendas. The agendas need to be clear and concise, and the agendas, really the pur purpose of them is to give notice to the public who would attend. Um, they are issued with the authority of the public body, and so this committee acts essentially with the authority as a committee of the Board of Trustees, and uh, actions need to be specifically listed if they're for action or if they're, they're for discussion. So it'll be on there. Uh, there's a big, I, I didn't write it this way, but there's a big all bold letters. It needs to stick to the agenda. Uh, because when you goes awry from the agenda, that's when you run into open meeting law issues. And if there's a time specific, if there's a time specified in the agenda that something will happen at a certain time, it needs to be stuck to that time. So that doesn't mean that in general, if there's not a specific time, things can be taken out of order. But if there is a specific time listed, that it has to be stuck to. Uh, serial communications and walking quorums are kind of legal concepts that um, that have been refined in recent years, and I do want to talk about. Serial communications are for members fewer than a quorum, 
uh, meet privately by either email or text message or phone to deliberate on matters within the committee's supervision and essentially accumulate a secret consensus on a matter that's coming forward before the committee. And so really, uh, serial communications and walking quorums are ways to prevent a whole quorum from splitting up, from a committee from splitting up into forming. You avoid the need for a quorum because you're not the full body there. And so um, you can't communicate by text individually, um, you know, and then have like a rolling poll to go, like, how would you vote on this sort of thing? It's, uh, these are just ways to, uh, that open meeting laws does not allow because it's really workarounds for the noticed open meeting issue. Walking quorums and serial communication are really the same thing. It's really a series of gatherings among separate groups of members uh, that doesn't arise to the level of a quorum, each less than a quorum, who would agree tacitly uh, to act in uniformity. And so, again, we just have to be cognizant of not doing that. So don't coordinate among small groups to avoid a quorum, essentially. Um, be careful about clicking reply all to emails. Uh, don't do that, because uh, reply alls could inadvertently create a meeting or create a deliberation when you didn't intend to do so. And so, Generally, don't reply all to, uh, to emails from staff or anything like that uh, because you don't want to inadvertently start a meeting uh, that didn't have a quorum and will be an open meeting law violation. Uh, this next one is on creating agendas and communities, and uh, I'm not going to go into it too much. This is really, it's, it's a lot more for staff than it is for the individual committee members. Uh, the chair and the vice chair, since they're involved in drafting committees, uh, these are kind of important reminders for uh, staff and for the chair and vice chair um, on some timelines and titles on the draft agenda and what the deadlines are on those two. Uh, but the, uh, uh, the recording secretary and the staff liaison will be there to help on those sort of issues. Now, the last one, and uh, I take my hat off that uh, our new chair has done wonderful tonight on this. We started including these. Uh, this is the very first meeting where we've been including these. This is kind of the anatomy of an action item. And it's important, I think, for all the members of committees to be on the same page as when they expect certain things to come up on agendized action items. And so I'll, I'm actually going to go through them one by one. The first step that happens is a chair calls an item. So example up here is this is item 2.04 of the agenda, discussion and possible action to do something. Uh, then there'll be a presentation by the staff, uh, again, if it's an action item. Then there'll be consideration of the item. So consideration of the item is really its discussion between the committee members and the staff person who's doing the present, presenting. And so that's really where the consideration uh, item happens. Next is a step for public comments. And so you have consideration after the presentation, then you have a pause for public comments. And then after public comments is deliberation. And that's the kind of collective discussion between members of the committee uh, prior to a motion being made on you've had your consideration, you've had your presentation, you've had public comments. Now it's up for you all as committee members to deliberate among yourselves and to try to come to a consensus that a motion can be made, and that's step six. And so a motion's made, motion's second, and then there is some discussion allowed on the motion uh, to either clarify the motion or really gain a better understanding of what the intent might be behind the motion, and it can be modified at that point too. Uh, and then the last step is action taken, where you all vote on the motion that's on the floor. So um, again, we thought it was important to let everyone know the order of action items here, just so you can anticipate when you might be called to do something in particular on an action item. Um, and so we have that here. But that is our brief primer on open meeting law issues. Again, Chief General Counsel Rombardo is the expert on this. I'm just a lowly employment lawyer, but uh, I'm happy to answer any questions that I possibly can on this, uh, if anyone has any. Thank you, Kevin. You give yourself more credit. Thank you. Um, <laughs> I do want to go back to the, I don't know what slide it is, open meeting law. There's the, the point on avoid using private phones and emails for public business. Can you expand a little bit for the committee on sort of why and also sort of your, your guidance on how that tactically should get sort of set up? Sure. You know, it's, um, if it's, uh, committee members can individually communicate with each other if it's um, 
obviously it needs to be, uh, they just can't come together in order to generate a consensus. And so it can't be one person calling each of the people in order to get votes on something and you know to generate a consensus and saying well this is how all these other people are going to vote let's you know then that sort of thing uh because again this is kind of uh the open meeting law and how nevada law has it is wants to avoid coordination among small groups in order to avoid a quorum and to avoid an actual noticed meeting and so individual communications are fine but communications they call them you know walking quorums or rolling quorums where it's gathering consensus bit by bit in order to avoid the open meeting law, that's not allowed. That's helpful, thank you. And I'm ch Neil's voice is in my head from past years reminding us that uh, as committee members, the emails that we use are subject to uh, pub public information requests, right? That's absolutely right. And uh, it was up there on the slides and I actually avoided talking about it, but I'm glad you reminded me, so thank you for doing that. Um, exactly, so uh, if, the, if you're talking about, if you're texting about the zoning committee and you're doing business that's related to the committee, don't do it over your private phone, don't do it over your private email because that is public record. And so, and it is, you know, uh, accessible through, uh, you know, public record documents, public record searches, things like that. And so it's important to stick to, uh, you know, district email, committee emails, things like that, uh, so that those can be maintained uh, into the future in case there is a public record request that's made. So I think the advice in, in, in the past is if you have personal emails, set up a, a separate one, because if you're using your personal inbox, that can be subject to the, the Information Act. So to new folks, if you haven't already, I think, I think most of us have like a Gmail, it's like WAC or WZAC Rogers or whatever. So just a reminder that that's a best practice so that you can sort of stay out of, out of this trouble. Any other questions from members of Kevin? I do. Um, when it comes to uh, making a motion, does it have to follow the language of the agenda item that is, um, you know, specific to that motion or, and how far can you go when you're, um, crafting a, a motion, you know, away from the agenda item. Just to fill on that, please. Yeah, it's, um, it has to be with, it has to be closely related, I would say, to the agenda item. And so it doesn't, a motion doesn't have to be specifically saying, like, you know, we pass, you know, uh, you know, uh, literally quoting the actual agenda item. You don't need to do that. Uh, but it needs, needs to be within the scope of the agendized item. And as long as it's within the scope of the agendized item, that's acceptable. And oftentimes, staff will bring suggested actual motion language in the slides. So it's a starting point. They tr staff is really helpful and tries to make it easy on us. We'll usually end up modifying it slightly, but uh, they make it easy. It's even on the agenda this evening in yellow for the first time. Um, so that's great. And then typically, council, you'll join us if there is action items on the agenda. Is that right? That's sort of been the precedent in the past. Uh, exactly right. It, um, and so, yes, it, uh, yes, we will be here. Cool. So you guys will help, help us make sure we're doing it right. Other questions? Very good. Kevin, thank you. Thank you very much. Moving on, item 2.06, presentation and discussion of the anticipated cadence of committee work, including the potential timeline for rezoning needs for the 2026-2027 school year including any requests from the Board of Trustees, and this is for presentation and discussion only. Hello, Tammy. You want to introduce yourself to the, the committee? Thank you. My name is Tammy Zerman. I'm the Chief Facilities Management Officer and going to be the liaison for the Zoning Committee. Um, we're going to kick Adam to the back seats for a little while and, and, and do these um, in his... In his he did a great job, but we need to kind of grow, and I need to grow in this too, so we're going to... You're going to see a lot of me. So I... This is one of the items that was asked for to be brought forward because it is a new school year for you guys and a lot of new people. What are we going to be doing for this school year? So September, we're here. Um, you guys have already done the majority of it, but uh, we're going to be talking about those items, um, this introduction to STED rezoning and the, the remainder of it. But then in October, we're going to continue STED rezoning um, and the presentation and discussions with enrollment projections and that that our demographer will be presenting to you guys we are going to have the meeting location be at stead 
elementary school because we've been asked and we believe that it's good to be in those communities. So we have a mobile uh, boardroom and we'll be having them in those communities. So we will set that up instead. It's October 17th is the date for that one. So it should be on your calendar. If not, we'll start getting you guys out some invites to put on your calendar so we can hold those spaces for you too. So, And then in November, if you guys don't choose to make a motion in October, we'll be coming back in November um, and having another meeting to discuss it again, possibly making an action. We'd let have an action in, in November for that. Um, and then we'll determine where we want to have it. Do we want to have it at another school in that area because that's what is best for them. Um, and so we'd like to take that motion or those recommendations to the board in November or December if we can um, and kind of wrap up stead if you will because we've got some more work to do in the second semester. And December because it's so close to Christmas um, and everybody has plans, we'll cancel that meeting. So. Then we move on to the second semester. And in January, because we have a new Vaughn being rebuilt on the Vaughn, on the Vaughn property at um, Bresson, we're going to be doing a rezoning for that. That is a facility modernization project, um, which is a real reason the guys, you guys are gonna have some work to continue is because of that facility modernization plan. February, we'll, we'll start that one here because it'll be an introduction. Um, and then in February, we'd like to go to Pine because that's going to possibly be one of the affected schools because of the, the rezoning for Vaughn. And then in March, again, if you guys don't make a motion in, in February, we would have another one and we'd like to have that one at Vaughn. Um, so maybe we can see a little vertical construction too and you guys can get a little bit of that um, while you're out there. But th that's the plan that we have set forward for that. April, Again, if you guys don't make a motion or, or make a recommendation, we can then have another meeting in April and we'll determine where that's going to be. Um, and then again in May, same thing, right? Um, and then in June, we cancel. We take a hiatus from June, July, and August. So that's the, the preliminary schedule that we see for you guys for the year, but it's gonna be a lot of work. So we thank you guys for coming and doing that work with us as staff. Thank you for the preview of the year ahead, uh, and it sounds uh, productive. Uh, I'd also like to thank uh, you and staff for enabling the visits into the community, it's something that I personally have stressed in the past. I know it's logistically and tactically not always easy, and it requires additional resources, but I think it's really important to go meet the community that we're uh, engaging where they're at. So thank you for enabling that. Any questions uh, from members of Tammy on the plan for the year? Adriana Publico yep. for the record. In past years, we've done some cleanup work around um, areas that have more, like aren't building a school or re rezoning an entire campus. Um, but it seems like we haven't done that work recently. Is, is that something we're going to do again at some point? So you're asking if we're going to just rezone a single school or? No, it's more like we would look at neighborhoods and areas where the lines were kind of all over the place. And I think there's still some irregularities Pockets. in the Northwest around Clayton. And we had talked about potentially looking at that again, but we didn't do that last year and it doesn't look like it's on the agenda for this year either. That's, and we've done that in the past. And I know, I know what you're talking about with Elmcrest and all of those pockets up in there. Um, I think with the facility modernization program and the plans that we have for that, those will come in time with all of that. If there is a desire from your chair and your, your vice chair to put that on an agenda, I mean, we, will, we can discuss that. We will be meeting with them monthly to go over agendas. And so they can obviously, if they're, they're your funnel, you can put that through them and they can ask us to put it on an agenda and do work on that. In January, could we meet um, at Vaughn in the old building? We'll, we'll have to see where we are with the construction in that. We thought we could meet in Pine because it's going to be an introduction, but it's an option if we want to, you know, if we want to move it to Vaughn, we can work to move it to Vaughn in January. Let's see where construction is, or sort of progress as we move into the year, but it's a good, good flag. Other questions of Tammy? Are you doing the next one as well? Cool, all right, all right, then you're we'll- You're stuck with me. 
<laughs> we'll close item 2.06, thank you, and move on to item 2.07. Presentation to update the Zoning Advisory Committee on the district-wide enrollment numbers for the 2024-2025 school year, and this is for presentation and discussion only. So this is really to ground the new members and maybe, you know, just to do a reminder of where we're at in the district as a whole. Um, you can see the top line is the population in Washoe County, and it's kind of steadily growing. Um, you go to the next line down, which I want to say it's green, but, um, and that is our student enrollment. And so we're at 60,481 as of last year. Count day isn't official yet, so that's last year's number, just so you guys know. I know you're looking at the numbers on the bar graph there. And then the number below that is in the red, our births in, the, in Washoe County. So we have a little bit of a declining enrollment in Washoe County and then declining birth rates as well in Washoe County. And that's not, that we're not the only people that see that, it's nationwide. So you guys may think when you see a development, we're gonna get lots of kids out of them. This would tell you something different, is that we're not having the same amount of births. This is a snapshot as of the 6th of September, um, Brett, and his, his team in the demography department do a great job. We've had some, some practice count days. Um, and so you can see the highlighted yellow is actual, pre-K all the way up through 12th and 13th, and then um, ungraded are more of our special education students that we retain until they're a, a little bit older age-wise. So that's what that means. I had to ask what that meant because I hadn't seen it in a long time. So um, those are our actual based off that. So right now we have a total of 59,677 students in all. Um, Brett does a projection every year, right? And those pre-K and kindergarten rates are based off of birth rates, right? Because we don't know necessarily what's coming. We project those. And then the rest of them are done based off of a roll-up of if you're a kindergartner, you're probably gonna roll up to first grade, right? So he does a great job of projecting those. Um, and then you can see the differences, right? Are the red, we didn't see as many as what we projected. And then the blue, we've seen more than what we projected. Um, and there's a lot of reasons for those, right? Schools, school of choice, we have a lot of charter schools. Um, we have lots of people that move into the district from out of state and that. So, we have some, we'll be able to look at those in more depth. We did do a great job, Brett did a great job of projecting what we would see for enrollment and we're up based off of his projections, right? And that projection equates into per, per pupil funding and the, the district's budget. So we know that we have a few more students than we thought we were gonna have, so we have a little bit more funds from that per pupil student funding. And so, Really, the, the final um, count day is, is in October, so we'll know exactly what we have in then and there in October. So that kind of grounds you in where we're at right now, what we've seen in growth in numbers or decline in numbers, as you saw on that, um, and that'll help feed some of that information that, that Brett will then be providing you for the STED enrollment and, and that breakdown. Thank you, Tammy. Any questions on the enrollment numbers? I know it's outside of the purview of the, the county, obviously, but I'm just curious if you have any data around like the trend in enrollments of charter or public schools in the, in, in the county as well. Like, are they observing a similar thing? We, it's really hard to get all that data. You kind of have to pry for it, and sometimes they provide it and sometimes they don't. So I don't know how accurate our data would be for that information for you guys. Okay. But we can, you know, as we ask and as we look at whether there's uh, meeting minutes and that kind of stuff, we kind of try to read those and find them in the board meetings too to see what they're saying. Any questions of Tammy? Well, before we let you off the hook, we have to wish you a happy birthday. Thank you. Uh, it's also Shannon's anniversary, so thank you both <laughs> for deciding to spend part of your day celebrating with us at Zach. All right, um, that's a good primer, and we'll move us into the, the, the final agenda item uh, of the evening, item 2.08. Uh, this is a presentation and discussion regarding the proposed enrollment zone adjustments for the 2026-27 school year, potentially impacting the following schools. Stead Elementary School, 
Lemon Valley Elementary School, and Silver Lake Elementary School. And this is for presentation and discussion only. It's time to start looking at some maps. Hi folks, my name is Brett Rodella. I'm the long range school planner for the Washoe County School District. That means I'm looking after uh, student enrollment projections going out 20 years at each grade level, at each school, um, trying to account for what we anticipate in terms of students. Um, okay. Um, I'm also looking at how we're using our facilities and making sure, you know, helping guide decision making on, on the fact that we are using our facilities optimally. We're not over capacity or under capacity at, at our schools. So as soon as we get connected here. Okay, sorry about that. I've outlined some objectives that I'm hoping you folks will humor me and, and engage with me in. The first of which is we want to most effectively and, and least disruptively provide zoning recommendations to the Board of Trustees on uh, our enrollment to populate Newstead in the fall of 2026. Um, secondly, my, my aim is to work collaboratively with you to those ends. Um, and I wanna encourage you to put on your hats to become the best data scientists and geographers you can be. Um, and I wanna encourage you to challenge this work, not just consume it, but question it and, and challenge it because that's where it, it becomes sharp and, and we clean it up and we do make the best recommendation possible to the community, to the, to the board. Um, so we're going to empirically challenge assumptions uh, and think critically and creatively towards the most optimal outcome. And then this evening, I wanted to give new committee members a gist for how Zach considers data and geography in making the best recommendations to the board of trustees. Uh, Wanted to present some guidance from admin rig 7107 um, about kind of that, that guides our decision making. I underline the key words here, so to get through them somewhat quickly and give respect to them appropriately. Uh, we want to keep subdivisions and small neighborhood units in the same attendance zone to the greatest extent possible. Number two, we want to keep students to their closest school to the greatest extent possible. Three, we want to create compact attendance zones with few or no island areas. Four, we want to create attendance zones that allow for growth and changing demographics. Five, we want to comply with feeder patterns. What that means is we want seamless, uh, seamless alignment between elementary and middle school to the greatest extent possible and middle school to high school. At the middle school to high school level, we have a lot, a lot of split feeding, meaning that a middle school will split feed into two or more high schools. We're trying to limit that, especially at the elementary school to middle school level um, and, and wherever we can at the middle school to high school level. This, this makes for analysis and projections a lot more, a lot cleaner, the cleanest that they can be. And we find that it's healthiest for students to, to maintain a vertical alignment um, with their peers as much as possible. And lastly, we wanna avoid transportation burdens to identifiable diversity subgroups. Fred, before we move on, I just want to sort of highlight this to the committee as well as new members because I think this list is a really important reminder of the ways that we are supposed to think about and making zoning recommendations. There are a bunch of different things that can enter your mind of like what makes sense for a zoning decision, but this is what we have been guided on as our found foundation of how to think about and make decisions. And so I think it's important to remind ourselves of that, but it's also I'd sort of make the request of you, Brett, and team that bringing us information about each of these elements in your presentation, whether it's transportation, it's close to schools. And so like, it's, I think it's a two way on like holding ourselves accountable to these standards. I just want to call that out before we get into the details and the importance of sort of that lens. 
Yeah, that sounds great, and I appreciate you contextualizing that with this. Um, I'll definitely seek to do that as we move forward. <clears throat> so to kind of get into the data a little bit, I wanted to start off with some intro on our student enrollment projections. The student enrollment projections is a pretty complex model. I'll get into some fundamentals of it in the next slide. But this is the end product of our student enrollment projections. It's classically been referred to as our brush fire charts. Um, I think you can refer to them as a student enrollment charts or student enrollment projection charts. But basically to break this down, if we look at Lemon Valley real quick, you can see Lemon Valley, the next column over is our capacities at Lemon Valley. Currently it's 678 students. Additional capacity to the right of that, 150, represents three mobile classrooms that we have comprising six classrooms um, that allows for 25 students apiece. We do not count mobile classrooms as a part of our permanent capacity, which is that 678 number. Uh, next column is current enrollments at Lemon Valley. As of September 6, we're at an enrollment of 631 students. Divide that by the max capacity, 678. Lemon Valley is currently operating at 93% of its capacity. And this is the same, this works the same for the projections moving into the future um, that, that gives the committee and our office a view into the future as to what we can expect schools um, impact from enrollments. Um, and this, this is, in my eyes, the most substantial piece of information that, that goes into Zach decisions. You might have a different view on that, but when it comes to the data, um, th this is the real meat and potatoes of it. The geography aspects matter and count, but the numbers mean a lot. <clears throat> so a little more on student enrollment projections. There's three main components of it. Kindergarten, rollover, and new development. And as Tammy said earlier, we're projecting kindergarten from, from births to mothers residing in Washoe County. So for the current kindergarten enrollments within the school district, we're taking data from 2018, births to mothers residing in, in um, Washoe County, and we analyze historic kindergarten trends to tell us how much of those births we receive as kindergartens. And that helps us project how many kindergartners we expect to receive district-wide. On the other end of that, we look at historic attendance for, of kindergartners at every school, um, and those historic attendance metrics project what we anticipate year to year at each school. Um, there is an element that projects births, and that comes from, from projected population, and this is the projecting births is for, you know, the current year and into the future where we don't have that birth data. Um, as far as rollover, Tammy mentioned this a little previously. Um, we look at rollover from one year to the next at every grade at every school. So, and we average those changes. So, for instance, at Stead Elementary over the past seven years, we have data that shows us how many students net gain or negative or loss we we get from going from first to second grade, second to third, so on and so forth. And that's factored into our projections. And then lastly, new development. We have a great data set on new development in the area where we use student data of students where they currently reside in homes that are five years or newer. And that gives us an idea for what these new developments, once they build out and, and people buy, purchase them, what we can expect to see in, in terms of new students at them. Charter schools recently we're accounting for, um, making a subtraction out of our student enrollment projections for them. Uh, it's a new practice as of last year and this year, and something that we're, we've got a little more work to do on, but it's uh, in progress. And then up at the top, I didn't skip this intentionally, but our student enrollment projections start with the starting students tab, which is a register of all students in the, in the current school year. And then going into the future, those numbers iterate considering our kindergarten, our rollover, and new development year after year to tell us what future enrollments look like. And you'll see more of that into this presentation. Um, so before we get really into the content of tonight's meeting, I wanted to uh, share this, this map with you. This is something that you and the public has access to. 
If you have a laptop that you want to bring to these meetings, I would encourage it. It'll allow you to kind of follow along a little more deeply into the geography of the lines and, and, and what, we're, what we're sort of proposing or entertaining in terms of options. Um, we're very proud of this and, and the ability to offer it forward. And we want to make it more data enriched so that um, it becomes more useful as a data tool um, and, and an analysis tool. And it empowers you all as decision makers. So getting into kind of the, the topic of tonight, which is STED, new STED. This is a look at what current conditions are like with enrollment boundaries at Stead Elementary, Silver Lake Elementary, Desert Heights, and Lemon Valley Elementary and Alice Smith Elementary. This also includes middle school zones that include O'Brien on the east side and Cold Springs is way up to the northwest. Um, if you have any questions about reading this data, let me know. I know it might, might be somewhat confusing, but essentially that purple line represents the middle school zone. And, and the, the color is intended to coordinate with the points of the schools where you, you might see O'Brien, it's the faint pink or purple in the middle next to Stead. That is meant to correlate with the purple line there. Um, Cold Springs obviously is out of the picture here, but, but it is also the same color as O'Brien. So that's, that's a kind of a, a hint for how to read this, this data. Um, and each, each white line correlates with the school, the red dot that's, that's in the center of it. So tonight we're entertaining option one. And again, this is generally for presentation and discussion. I don't think we're making decisions tonight, but this is an example of what an option, a zoning option would look like. Um, and it's, I would say that it's the most simple and straightforward when it comes to populating new stead that our office has, has, is recommending. Um, you know, and I, and I would put it to the committee. I would challenge you to try to make it more simple if you can. Albert Einstein has a quote. He says, everything should be made as simple as possible, but not simpler. So don't overcomplicate the simplicity either, but, but, but seek to refine this if we can. Um, as the numbers, as numbers work out with this option, it, it works, it works very cleanly. Um, and again, it, it just made a lot of sense from a kind of a first take. When it comes to this work, it's very sensitive, the impact that we have on the community. And I think we could probably all agree that the lowest impact to the community, keeping it as simple as possible is probably going to be one of our best approaches. If we have to get more complex, we can and will. Um, to get a little more into this, into this option, sorry, we're looking at Stead moving to Silver Lake, which is that uh, the red hatched polygon on the left side. And then there's two areas of Lemon Valley moving to Stead, a north and a south. So that's what the ST to SL mean, and then the LV to ST, north and south. Uh, getting a little more detailed view on these, um, inside those red hatched polygons, there's a, just a articulation of multifamily properties and single family subdivisions on as a, as a whole, we're looking at impact. We'd be looking to impact about 1400 residences total. If we were to move on these changes, um, nearly 450 single family units and almost a thousand multifamily, um, apartments. Um, so I just wanted to put this in here to kind of show you the sort of level of detail that we can and, and do get to when it comes to these analyses. If you had questions along these lines, we can break these things up. Um, the numbers in each polygon represent the total number of, of units within that polygon. Uh, Adriana Publico, for the record, will Newstead have the same capacity as Oldstead? Newstead is going to increase by about 58 students. I mean, yeah. the building. Yeah. Okay. Yep. So 680 plus 58. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, New, Newstead will be about 738. It's designed to 750, but the way that we have plans to utilize it right now includes the addition of a special ed program that will take away a little bit from that capacity. So I'm running with a 738 figure right now. 
Real quick, Michelangelo yeah. Rando. Mm -hmm. um, the number of units impacted, that is just uh, the raw unit, not families, not students impacted. It's just when you say 447 single family, that's just 447 houses. And then 984 multifamily, that's just 984 units in an apartment, correct? That's correct. Okay. So to get into the methods, logic, and techniques for how we're conducting this work, um, if you recall the, the hatched polygons, the Stead to Silver Lake and the Lemon Valley to Stead, North and South, what we start with is an analysis of how many students have been zoned in those areas and how many attend their zone school. And the logic that we're carrying forward is that the, the students that are zoned and attending their zone school, we can treat them as if they would be zoned and attending a school if they were zoned in a different school. So that's, that's the logic there. Um, and for each one of those, those polygons impacted areas, we're, we're taking a total of the attending and averaging them as of the past four years. I'd go back further, but the, the years 2021 and 1920 were not great years when it came to enrollment. And I think it, it fudged the data set a little bit. So with those averages, we condense those averages. That's what the, these top tables represent and the blue highlighted cells represent the average of intended of attending and zone students for each area at each grade level. Um, I mentioned the projection tables when it came to the student enrollment projections. And for example here, what we're doing to, to impact the projections and move the needle on, on what we can expect to see if these changes were to occur is we'll, we see that at Stead, the Stead to Silver Lake impacted area, they averaged over the past four years, 11 kindergartners that were zoned and attending Stead. So we take that 11 and we add it to the 2026-27 student enrollment projection table. We add that to Silver Lake and we subtract it from Stead. And we do that at each grade level. And because of the rollover and the nature of the student enrollment projection model, those tables iterate one year to the next so that those changes will will be reflected in the first grade, or sorry, the second grade, excuse me, first grade in the 2027-28 table. And they'll iterate and, and click upwards, so on and so forth for 20 years. Um, I wanted to point out that, that with these methods here, we're hitting upon kindergarten, new development, and those rollover changes. If you look down towards the bottom left, those are our rollover metrics um, from going from K through first and then first to second. That's where we're analyzing seven years data previous of rollover at every school, every grade level to give us an idea for Lemon Valley there, K through first grade, we, we typically add six students to the enrollments. First through second grade at Lemon Valley, we typically add six students to the enrollments. Just to give you an idea for the respect for which we're given the data and the articulation and, and the thoroughness, I'd, I'd say, of that. Um, one other point to point out on this slide is we have some new development occurring in the Lemon Valley to Stead South impacted area. And the same way that we do student generation rates, um, we generated the anticipated student generation from those new developments, and they've been input into these numbers to inform our projections moving forward. One of the biggest items I'd say on, you know, concerning enrollments in the North Valleys has to do with Mater Academy in Northern Nevada, who has plans and intentions to open up a 1,550 student capacity K through 12, directly adjacent to Alice Smith. Um, there's a breakdown of, of what their student enrollments look like at each grade level. Um, that's 620, 450, and 480. That's at full capacity. The school district's anticipating an opening of 2627 of that school. Um, published plans indicate a year one uh, K through nine enrollment of 790 students. And right now for year one, they are expecting 542 students. I'm calculating 89% of that 542 students is coming out of North Valleys. 
And, you know, we can play with the metrics. We can play with these numbers. Um, right now, we're looking at the proximity of schools relative to this. We're going to compare we're going to compare these numbers relative to previous openings of charter schools and try to find some correlation. Um, but we're going to do our best to project what what impact to Washoe County schools we expect from this school. And then last point is that Mater is operating a, about a 490 student capacity school near uh, Matthews Elementary, which is a K-6 and is intended to continue. So this is a look at the tiers. Um, tier zero is indicated in red. Um, as you can see, the anticipated Mater Golden Valley on the map is right next to Alice Smith. Moving beyond tier zero into the orange is tier one. Um, and it's, it, this is really based off adjacency, school, school zone adjacency to the proposed Mater. Um, extending beyond that is tier three, which includes Desert Heights and Silver Lake in yellow. And then Gomes and Inskeep are represented in green tier three. Um, we do anticipate adding a tier four, which would include uh, Northeast Reno area schools, Sun Valley and university area. And then a tier five will include students not within Washoe County School District, homeschool, other charters, et cetera, that we really can't have a metric on, but we'll make our best guess. Brett, Brett sorry, one question yeah. on tiers. Tiers is a new thing to me. I haven't seen that before. Yeah. So is this, is, can you ex just give the foundation of the concept of tiers? Yeah, mainly, it, be, yeah, I'll put it this way. The, so the anticipated Mater Golden Valley School going right next to Alice Smith, if you can see it on the map, because it's right directly adjacent to, to Alice Smith, we anticipate Alice Smith being impacted by that school more intensely than any other school. So the tiering is, is a way of just kind of tiering the, the impact that we anticipate from Mater Golden Valley. As you get further away from the school, we expect less impact. Closer to it, we, we expect a more intense impact. So to break the numbers down on that a little bit, this slide represents what things are currently projected for in terms of impact from North Valley's area elementary schools, a 542 student enrollment at Mater Golden Valley. I think probably the most significant data point on here is that far right co column that is total number of students per school, where in tier zero or Alice Smith Elementary, we anticipate them losing about 92 students. Um, in tier one, about 70 students per school, and that included three different schools, Bennett, Stead, and Lemon Valley. Um, tier two, we're expecting a loss of about 42 students. Tier three, minus 25. And then tier four to be determined, and the tier five students outside of WCSD. Um, we'll make our best guess and, and let, let the actuals inform us. We're doing the same thing at the middle school level. I just wanted to kind of illustrate that. I don't think it's as significant as the as the elementary school or as, as weighted as it pertains to what we're talking to tonight with Stead. But to give you an idea that, that we are doing this at the middle school level with O'Brien being sort of the ground zero of, of impacts to Mater, they're considered tier zero. And then beyond that um, into Tier one is Desert Skies Middle School and Cold Springs Middle School on either side of O'Brien's enrollment boundary. The numbers for, for the middle school impacts are as follows. Um, one important point on this is that right now, Mater's anticipating 62 seventh grade students year one. Um, I think they're, they're currently operating at about a 70 student per per grade level. So where it sits right now, I'm expecting that because they're K through six currently, that their seventh grade enrollment year one will matriculate mostly from their current K through six. Uh, and then tier two will expand beyond zero, tier zero and one. So kind of 
bringing this presentation in for a landing, um, I wanted to recap that we've we've analyzed and looked at our zone versus attending, and talked a little bit about how our projection tables iterate from one year to the next. Um, and we've talked about Mater Academy and anticipated impacts from Mater, and then kind of presented some ideas for what our office has immediately identified as good options for making rezones for the new stead that impacts Silver Lake Elementary and Lemon Valley Elementary. And to wrap it up, this is how it looks. We that that top table you saw at the beginning of our presentation that represents our current capacity conditions and then after all things that we just discussed are considered um, the zone versus attending and and Mater is included in both of these tables um, the capacity conditions after option one are that bottom table um, which you know the bottom table arguably informs the best decision when it comes to what uh, zoning options to make um, that red line on that bottom table tells us that the 26 27 school year is when these changes will go into effect <clears throat> hey brett yeah Holly, Holly boardman um i might have missed this earlier on about why the old stead is closing and why there's a new stead and the timing of it of why it's happening at the same time that we're guessing about a, a charter school. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, the FMP, the Facilities Modernization Plan, identified STED as a school replacement based off of its age and condition. And the FMP was pretty well established and almost, almost doctored in. It was a month before we found out about Mater Golden Valley. So the momentum of all that has carried itself forward and we're following up on our promise to deliver upon a new school at stead um, the school district has owned the property that that new stead is being built upon for a number of years so we've been anticipating this for quite a while um, and and our the trajectory of our plan is is moving forward so hope that answers your question <clears throat> Shannon Coley. When did Mater first open the K through six? It's a good question. I don't know off the top of my head and I can, I'll write that down and bring it to our next meeting if that'll work for you. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and you, do you know their, their population right now? They're at about 490. Yeah. 490 K through six and with intentions K to maintain that. Okay. And it's, it's through six. Okay. Yep. Brett, thanks for the presentation. As we're starting to orient ourselves to this, I think it'd be helpful if you could share with, with sort of remind the committee too, some of the principles that you guys use when thinking about boundary line adjustments, mm -hmm. whether it is major roads or just like, can you just remind us some yeah. of the logic that you apply to the maps? Definitely. Yeah. The major roads, any geographical barrier that makes sense, drainages, mountains, roads, highways, um, Differences in subdivisions, you know, newer subdivisions versus older ones. Sometimes we will draw a line there. If there's a clear distinction, if there's a if there's a clear enough distinction, geographically to make there, um, or or that's practical to make. Um, so that's it. I mean, we do. You know, we want to one. You know, a major approach is impacting as few students as possible, but as is necessary too. We need to balance our enrollments. Um, but we do want to limit the impact. And, and again, to your point, roads, mountains, uh, drainage ways, that's about as, as technical as that gets, if that's fair. Adriana Publico, um, can I assume from the fill colors on these diagrams that optimal utilization of a school campus is between 66 and 89 percent yeah in my opinion i think 80 percent is probably optimal other people might have different perspectives on that especially principals and but that's the number that i've kind of learned has been best case thank you um are we going to see more options next month or is this kind of like 
bound by what's going on that there is just one option for that this school. I mean, that's that's what we've got tonight, and and my my approach on this is keep it simple. If you and I was gonna yield to the committee to make recommendations on what you'd like to see if we are going to move into different options. I think we can get to sort of a cross committee discussion, but like let's let's use the time now for questions to Brad. Kristen DeHaan, for the record, <clears throat> with the Sky Vista Village, um, it looks like there is a line already between, I'm assuming that that's an apartment complex, um, but there's a white line through the middle of it, and I was wondering, is that? Sorry, it's just two different subdivisions. It, it... So is there a road or anything, or it's just that's where the the apartments break up it's kind of where the like the the developer just you know either had property owned property and they designed their development there and then maybe another developer had adjacent property or it's the same and they designed it that way that's all that that line represents okay so yeah. it's not like it's a big road or no anything. it's not okay. yeah it, it, if anything that there is probably a, a very local residential type road yeah Uh, Ryan Henderson, for the record, <clears throat> are there any other charter schools or projected others to come in beyond this one? Yeah, Pinecrest, we recently, Pinecrest Academy, Northern Nevada and Spanish Springs, we anticipate um, coming on the scene with uh, a high school. Um, and off the top of my head, I'm, I'm kind of blanking on, on what else we've got, but I can make a note of that and bring that info next meeting. Yeah, I'm just okay. kind of curious if those were in the projections too with that anticipation. At this point, no. Um, but I can say, however, that any that we are unaware of any charters impacting this area. So anything else throughout the community would, would not impact these numbers. Melissa Cook Sanford for the record. Um, I was also going along that line because Snacks is a very big charter school in the North Valleys and if there was plans for expansion out there and, and I know I think it's K-8 and how that might affect at least our K-8 enrollments in these areas. Gotcha. I don't, I'm unaware of, of Snacks intentions to expand. Um, we're always trying to keep our ears out for that. Um, and, and that it is a, a school district sponsored charter. It gives us, you know, it makes us privy to their student enrollments and things. So, um, question about cold Springs enrollment, current enrollment is 52%. Yeah, it, that's, it's a, it's a low, low populated school. And lately, as of the start of this current school year, 12 classrooms have gone to the application of early childhood ed. So we have an early childhood ed being used or utilizing space at Cold Springs Middle School that's providing early childhood services to North Valley's community. And that's included in the 52%? No, that is not, no. sorry. Okay. I mean, okay. I, that's that's just intended to kind of explain that we're we're maximizing the utility of that building. Okay, yeah. Yeah, okay. As, as best we can. Brett, are you? Holly Wardman, um, so your current conditions, if you did nothing, and with what you know about the charter school, are those the numbers for do nothing? That would, yeah. Okay, so if that's the case, we're kind of just moving those numbers around in the next one. Is there a reason why we want to rezone people if they're sort of all in the same ballpark again? Just moving I'll, numbers around? I'll go back to a map here and especially when it comes to the Lemon Valley to Stead impacted areas on the east side here. The reason we have it, I, we've identified these as, as useful for rezone is the adjacency to the school and the roadway network there. It made a lot of sense to, to bring them into the new school based off of their location. Um, and as a result of that, I think the, the same argument is made that as we bring them in, uh, relinquishing some students from Stead that are closer to Silver Lake made equal sense. Are, are the lake, are they walkable to the new Stead? The lakes and the Vista Enclave, are those walkable? 
Most likely, but don't quote me on it. We can dig into that a little more. I'm just curious about busing and, and whether it's going to impact busing going to these kids went to Lemon Valley, correct? That's correct. I'll, I'll check in with my transportation department on that. Because those kids definitely were bused. Mm -hmm. So that will impact busing. Okay. Yeah. Tyler Rogers for the record, and I think building off of what Polly said, like this is, I'm used to seeing, do you call that a sagebrush chart? Uh, brush fire charts. Brush fire charts. Yeah. Cool. I, I, like, I like that. Um, this is like the least colorful brush fire chart that I think I've seen. <laughs> Usually it's red and orange. And so it's interesting <laughs> to see one that, as sort of Polly pointed out, like there isn't a clear problem on the surface from this chart. Mm -hmm. um, and so tr I'm just trying to further understand the problem you're trying to solve. Um, and you've, I mean, you've, you've said it there, like there's, and I think I'm curious to hear from the community about like the pain that they feel mm -hmm. of like making those changes and the desire. So that's sure. all the more reason for us to go out to Stead. Um, but if there's a way for staff to get that surfaced from the, the district staff or the principals that are there to mm -hmm. articulate that, I think yeah. it would be helpful. Um, because on the surface, it's just, yeah, it's not like this clear big change between the, the options. And so yeah, I'm just trying to get a further understanding of the, the, the rationale for a change. Yeah, to me it seems like the main rationale is the fact that we're establishing a new school. It's not a new school, it's a, it's a new facility building and, and giving respect to that um, and identifying that these Silver Lake apartments in Turtle Creek subdivision and Silver Shores are, are closer to Silver Lake. I would argue that it, it it's best practice to to go along here. Um, and again, just the, the um, these newer developments and their adjacency to the new school is, is kind of trying to optimize that, that reach. Adriana Publico, um, it's hard to tell the scale on these maps. How far is the new campus or the future campus from the current Stead campus? I haven't measured that. Um, if I were to guess, let's, I'd say half a mile. Pretty close. I'll measure, we can measure that. Melissa Cook for the record. Um, I kind of wanted to follow up with the transportation impact. Um, just, yeah, we'd be interested to know with this projection of this option one um, and the movement of each one of these pocket areas, how many of those would be bust, not bust, and then what would be the potential cost and or savings for the district? Okay, I will follow up on that. Okay, I'm going back to what Tyler said and Polly. It seems like this Turtle Creek, Silver Lake, they are zoned for Stead, correct? Correct. We're going to disrupt them and put them in Silver Lake, which is an older school, and not bring them to the new Stead that they think they're probably going to, and then taking the Lemon Valley kids that assume they're going to Lemon Valley and putting them in the new Stead. I think there's going to be the old people thinking they're going to the new school. Nope, you're not, but we're taking these guys that we're never ever being considered to going to the new stead. Sure. Seems like a disruption that doesn't need to happen. Yeah, and, and challenge that away. That's that's your, your role. And I, I support you in that, you know. I, I, I feel like these kids in Turtle Creek and Silver Lake deserve the new step. I think the main thing is is adjacency to it and, and crossing over Stead Boulevard and, and transportation. These are all kind of factors that, that do come into play. Um, these kids are bust already. I mean, these kids are not walking to the old Stead. Sure. Maybe relieving them to, the, to Silver Lake and not requiring busing helps, helps that. Maybe. I, I, it, doesn't, it looks a little far for me. I think they're still going to be bust. I get, I get why. I get why you would want the, the Vista and the <clears throat> lakes to go to the Newstead, but I, I have a feeling these people would like to go to the Newstead also. 
Kristen DeHaan, for the record. Um, I, I have a definite understanding of having the lakes and the Vista Enclave going to the new stud, having um, way back, uh, I had to pass a school to get to my kids' elementary school, and that is a very frustrating thing, especially if you are moving to a new area, like, but I'm passing the school that's right here. Um, so it, that makes a lot of sense to me, and um, I'm, I'm judging on your, this is half a mile. So then I, I don't know that the Silver Lake apartments would be bust at this point if they were going to Silver Lake. They would definitely be bust if they were going to the Newstead. I don't think that they would be bust if they're going to Silver Lake. So I think this this is an important opportunity for us to give feedback to, to Brett of what we want to speak about next time. So I think we owe, owe that to Brett. I think we've heard about uh, transportation, more details on that. Are there other specific ideas or options that the committee would like to look at next time? I think we've heard one idea about sort of a difference with uh, Turtle Creek and Silver Creek lake not included but are there other ideas and options that folks want to see back from from Brett and staff next time yeah Cami Loray for the record um, I think the scale helps I think that the uh, the Turtle Creek and the Silver Lake um, proximity to Silver Lake Elementary School could make some very good sense if we saw in context of the distance between that neighborhood to Silver Lake and that neighborhood and to Newstead I think that that would be um, good information to help us make a decision um, yeah, that sounds it. good. Thank you. Noted. Michelangelo Aranda for the record. The other thing that would be really helpful to understand the impact is to know the number of students currently enrolled in those communities that are going to be impacted. So not just the number of houses and apartments, but the actual number of students that would be impacted by it. Yeah, we've got that in that zone versus attending. That, yeah. So for the current school year, especially on that bottom table on slide 11, it shows you how many students are, are attending in each one of those areas, their zone school, which is, is who we anticipate impacting. So those are the impact, impacted ones specifically? Yeah, and, and, and obviously, so current fifth graders, current fourth and fifth graders will not be impacted because they'll, they'll be matriculated out by then, but K through third will, um, and you can essentially count on the the numbers in that attending column as being impacted, K through third. I'll, I'll add this is that the fourth through fifth graders currently will matriculate into middle school by that time and in that column be impacted in a um, O'Brien to Cold Springs change. Okay, following up on that, if I'm looking at this correctly, you're saying that the number of students impacted that would be moving from Lemon Valley to Newstead would be currently zero kindergartners, one first grader, two second graders, three third graders, two fourth, no, not the fourth grader, but not those the are the numbers we're looking at. That's correct. And then the, the next one over, Lemon Valley, no. No, that, I, oh, I thought I had it, but is that labeled wrong? Like, um, there's, there's the Lemon Valley to Stead North and the Lemon Valley to Stead South. Oh, gotcha. And then there must be another one that's Silver, Silver Lake to Stead? Stead to Silver Lake. Stead to Silver Lake. On the left side. Okay. If you look at the top of that table, it, it shows the... Yeah, I'm just having trouble deciphering the shorthand. Sorry about what that. What means what. Yep. Yeah. Um, if but you, it's if relatively it's, small numbers of students overall, right, is what I'm seeing, like one or two or three per grade level per polygon. Especially at the Lemon Valley, in the Lemon Valley polygons, yeah. And, yeah. Kristen Hahn, for the record, I think for the next time, um, and I believe this is one of the things that were done, was done before, instead of having the number of units, if it had the number of students that would be impacted, that would be more helpful because we would be able to see it without flipping and trying um, to understand the new table. Will do. Thank you. Any other specific ideas and options for <coughs> our next gathering for Brett Jackham? Can I can I speak? Um, you know, if you folks want to make the case not to 
not to make changes here. No one's pressuring you to make that recommendation. This is your recommendation and and at the end of the day, your best judgment to the board is what this is all about. So um, just want to encourage that, whatever it's worth to y'all. Thanks. Melissa Cook, for the record, um, it would be helpful to, I, I know when we were doing the Spanish Springs last year, if there was any projected um, additional apartment complexes and additional developments coming in that might affect this number in the coming years. Yeah. So that would be helpful as well. Yeah, and that's been accounted for within this analysis. Um, on this slide 12, the table sort of in the middle to the right side shows what we would anticipate out of new development in terms of zoned and attending, and those are projected as of um, what's existing currently. Kami Larry for the record. So is there a pain point here? Help guide, you know, sort of the thrust of making the recommendations that you have made in option one. Is it primarily to, uh, you know, there's there's got to be a few objectives that you are shooting for with that, if you could let us know. I think generally, along with the FMP, we're looking to clean up enrollment boundaries where it seems most appropriate. Um, that seem to, to make sense with a new school. Um, you know, where we can get kids to their closer attending school um, to follow along with that principle. I would say that's, that's the main one, is, is it's just coinciding with, with the FMP and, and our goals of, of optimizing our enrollment boundaries. You know, to some degree, I, I look at enrollment boundaries as living organisms, almost like a, like a plant cell, right? They take different forms and shapes throughout their lifespan. And... I know that it's it causes a lot of pain throughout the community, or it can, um, but to some degree, I, th I think it's healthy to look at it that way, um, and and minimize the extent to which we have to to execute rezones. Hey Brett, do you remember which year it was that we moved all these people around out here? Remember when we were out in Cold Springs and we did this? How many yeah, years ago was it? It was probably four or five years ago. Okay. I'm going to follow up on the history of that and, okay. and bring more details next next month. Okay, thanks. I think it was March of 2020. I think it was the last meeting we had, like three days before we all went home forever. <laughs> wow, forever. solid memory. Forever. Can affirm that? <laughs> you were there. That's true. I will never forget that. <laughs> That night, you know, our liaison was Paul Lamarca at the time. He's like, should we even be meeting? And I'm like, I don't know what's going on. <laughs> <laughs> really quick, Britt, the Sky Vista Village, that they go to Lemon Valley now, correct? Correct. And you want them to go to the Newstead? The idea is to get them into Newstead based off of proximity to the school and, and the roadway networks Yep, there. I see that. Yeah. Um, and where's the number? Where's that number? of? That number represents total number of units within that polygon. Or, sorry, what is the number of students impacted? Yeah, wh where's the number for that? Uh, okay, so that represents Lemon Valley to Stead North. Uh, north, okay. Yeah, okay. so okay. I think that's the, the middle column there. Got it, okay. Yep. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any last requests of Brett before we try to close this out? It's helpful if you make cute names for the little shapes. <laughs> All right. They're easier to remember. I'll try. I'll, try. <laughs> like, I'll do my best. Heads up. I think to close this out, I, I, I mean, given the impact that we're sort of creating a need in some ways, I, I'm really eager to hear from the community. So anything that staff can do to elicit that, uh, okay. I'm glad we're going out there. But hearing from these folks, especially since we're trying, the hypothesis to get you physically closer uh, to the school that you're closest to, um, I just want to hear from the community as much as we can. Okay. Do you have enough from us, Brett? To I think so. <laughs> you know, yeah. you know, we didn't talk much about about different geography options, and if you want to see those options. Um, do you want to talk, do you want to see some recommend, give me some recommendations there? Where are you at with that? Oh, I'll turn. 
I would just be interested, like, what are the ge geographical boundaries or issues? Like, are there big goalies? I mean, they have random lakes that appear out there mm -hmm. <laughs> that don't go away. Um, so I think that would be some of, at least my question, I guess. Um, the proximity makes a lot of sense to me, but what are those geographical issues that we might be facing? Yeah. And along and those same lines, um, traffic patterns, if there are certain places where everybody's turning left or something like that, because sometimes that's a big impact. Okay. I think beyond that, like specifically, I'm just sort of curious if we stripped away the three polygons individually, like if you take away one, what does it look like if you took away two? Mm -hmm. Just to sort of understand if you want to minimize impact, sure. what that looks like on the numbers. I, th I think as far as that goes, your most significant impact would be at that Stead to Silver Lake area. I've got the net gain and loss for each one of these, for each school. Um, so the move from Lemon Valley to Stead represents a, a loss of about 37 students to, to Lemon Valley. The move from Stead to Silver Lake represents a gain of 69 students to Silver Lake. And the move from Stead to Silver Lake represents a net loss to Stead of 32 students. So between all these moves, Lemon Valley and Stead are losing students and, and Silver Lake is gaining. So I think that, that's Super helpful data. So if we can just surface that in the next session, that'd be great. Sounds and good. Just on slides. Um, not to miss that Cold Springs and O'Brien have an interchange of 31 students with O'Brien relinquishing 31 students and Cold Springs gaining 31 students. And and I will say that that would be a, prob a lot more of a tremendous impact transporting out to, to Cold Springs than, than going to O'Brien. Any final questions or comments for Brett? Maybe Einstein would be happy with us just doing nothing. On this one. <laughs> Thank I you, like Brett. It. Hey, we'll thanks for the opportunity. Next time. Appreciate everyone's time. Thank you. Okay, that brings us to the end of uh, items two on our agenda. The final bit of being any remaining public comment. Shannon, do we have any remaining general public comments this evening? Yes, from Pablo Nava Duran. Hey, Pablo. Here we go. So the so the enrollment, the final enrollment, should be on October first. Uh, let's have Adam Seeley to respect the, what the woman counts for that. So so right now we're focusing on that. So we'll see you in October and January. We we'll talk, you know, me at Vaughn or maybe Pine Mill School in January. So you ever know the Pine Mill School about to close in twenty twenty six. With the new Vaughn rezoning, take you more joy. Kid from, from mostly from Pine to Vaughn Middle School and to, by starting fall of 2026 to 2027. And in addition to some of the few kids from Pine go to Monty Harris or to Poly Middle School. So thank you. Thank you, Pablo. Do we have any announcements for public comment? No. Very good. Uh, then we'll move to item 3.02, announcement of our next meeting, which will be October 17th, 2024, with the intent to be at Stead Elementary School, with more information to come from staff. And with that, we'll adjourn the meeting at 7.13. Thank you.